Hey everyone, welcome back to the Weekend Charts, where I run through the most important charts and themes in markets and investing. Another big show for you this week. We're going to talk about the Fed. We're going to talk about inflation, interest rates, recession probabilities, and more. So let's start out by jumping in, talking about that Fed meeting, and try to answer this question, was that the last hike? So before we get into that, this is the uh, tweets that I like to put out before each and every Fed meeting and essentially predicting what the Fed will do uh, and how do I get these right? So this time around, I said that the Fed would hike 25 basis points and a lot of people responded saying, no, they're not going to hike at all or they're going to hike 50 basis points. How did I know it would be 25? I don't have any special predictive powers. All I do is look at what the market's expectation is heading into the meeting and what was priced in was 25 basis points. And that's exactly what the Fed does. And the Fed doesn't like surprises. So over the last decade, the Fed has pretty much done every single meeting what the market has expected it to do heading into that meeting. And before that, you know, there were times where the Fed would do something different. There would be a surprise a rate hike or a surprise rate cut. Uh, but in the last decade, really, we haven't seen that. It's been whatever the market's expectation is, the Fed does. So at some point, I'll get this wrong because the Fed will they'll do a surprise. But up until that point, it seems to be the status quo. It's a pretty good bet to say that the Fed's going to do what the market's expecting it to do. Now, where does that bring us in terms of hikes? Well, that's nine rate hikes now, 475 basis points increase since the Fed started hiking rates only a year ago in March of 2022. And this is the fastest rate hiking cycle we've seen since the early 1980s. So very fast in a one year period, the Fed is almost hiking 5% going from zero to a new range of 4.75 to 5%. So that brings the Fed funds rate for looking at the lower bound that 4.75 up to its highest level since September 2007. So getting there and getting there very quickly and really what everyone was looking at is really the change in language. They wanted to see something from the Fed to suggest that there wouldn't be many more rate hikes. And that's exactly what they got. The Fed took away that statement saying that they anticipate ongoing increases in the target range. So that's been there for a while. And they changed that to say they're going to closely monitor incoming information and assess the implications for monetary policy. And they're going to anticipate some additional policy firming may be appropriate. So some additional policy uh, firming may be appropriate. You can translate that to saying, well, it may be and it may not be. So they're going to take what happens, let's say, in between now and the next meeting in early May uh, and make that decision. And so possibly the Fed could be done. And indeed, that's what the market uh, is suggesting, that the Fed is done with rate hikes for this cycle. And again, caution uh, to read too much into this because this changes wildly from data point to data point and week to week. Uh, but the market's currently saying the Fed is done hiking rates and that they're actually going to start cutting rates sometime maybe in June or July of this year. And they're going to continue cutting rates all the way throughout the rest of the year into 2024. So uh, why would the Fed be cutting rates at that point? Well, we're going to talk about that. But first, why is there now room for the Fed to pause? So before we're going to get rate cuts, the Fed has to stop hiking rates. And I think there's three pretty good reasons uh, for the Fed to pause. So looking at that May, May meeting, uh, they're going to be pointed to, I think, these three things if they're going to pause the inflation data, which continues to trend lower. Uh, so that's really number one. They're, they're hiking rates, obviously, to fight inflation. So if inflation becomes less of an issue, they have room to slow down to pause, to reassess, and hopefully that inflation rate will continue to come down and then they won't have to resume hiking rates at a later point. Two, we have this new development of the banking crisis, which they alluded to in their statement, saying that's going to tighten financial conditions. And what they're basically saying there is that's going to lead to more of a slowdown perhaps in the economy. That's a deflationary type of event. Uh, so that's going to put additional pressure on that inflation rate, bringing it down. So banking crisis, let's say banks are going to lend less. It's going to lead to less economic activity, less demand, less growth, less inflation. And lastly, on the economy, uh, we're seeing increased evidence of potential slowdown. We're going to talk about retail sales in a little bit. 
uh, but a uh, number of signs of leading indicators continue to point to an economic slowdown. While the employment data isn't there just yet, I think there's enough other data to suggest that the Fed uh, will likely be talking about that or thinking more about that in the months to come. So three pretty good reasons to pause. But let's start with that lower inflation and just look at where the Fed funds rate is now in relation to the inflation data that the Fed likes to look at. So now we finally have a Fed funds rate, if we look at the lower bound here, above the core PCE inflation rate. And the core PCE is something that the Fed always talks about being their preferred measure of inflation. So we finally have tight monetary policy where we have that Fed funds rate above that inflation. And if you remember uh, in these videos in the past year, I've been saying the Fed is going to continue to hike most likely until we get above that rate of core PCE. Well, now we're above it. Uh, could they do one more? Certainly. Uh, but they're at finally at the point where they have now room to say we're going to pause and perhaps reassess uh, with the expectation that this core PCE is likely to come down, let's say, in the coming months. And if we look at overall CPI, well, still above that core PCE level, but moving down pretty quickly now, we have a downward trend since last June. So last June, inflation peaks at 9.1%. We're down to now 6%. And really, the expectation is this going. This is really going to show significant declines in the next few months because that year-over-year -year comparisons are really going to become much more favorable. We'll talk about that later in terms of commodity prices. But looking at the major components of that inflation report, uh, what really stands out uh, versus last June? Well, pretty much the majority of the major components have a better inflation reading than last June. If you look at medical care, apparel, uh, used cars, um, food away from home ticked up a little bit, but new cars down, food at home finally starting to move down, electricity, gas utilities, gasoline, fuel oil, so all of the energy components down since last June. The big one that stands out in terms of what hasn't gone down since last June is that shelter component. And I say it's a big one because it's 34, over 34% of the index is just that shelter component. So most people, their biggest expense by far is that housing expense. So shelter continue to move up. But as we've talked about, shelters are very lagging indicators. So they're taking into account the data months after it changes. And here we're showing the comparison of shelter CPI, which hit uh, 8.1% in February, that's the highest since the early 1980s, uh, versus actual rents. So rental data from apartment list, their year-over-year -year rate of change is down to 3% and has been moving lower for some time. So as I've been saying, shelter CPI has been playing catch-up, and certainly there might be a little bit more to go. But I expect in the next few months, at some point, you're going to see a rapid slowdown in that rate of increase, and perhaps it starts moving in the other direction, assuming that rents uh, continue to trend lower in terms of their growth rate. We've even seen an outright decline, let's say, over the last uh, five months in terms of rent. So I think this will be the most important factor to watch uh, for that core rate of inflation, obviously, shelter, huge component there. But even the overall, once shelter shifts, you're going to see that overall CPI uh, very quickly start to move lower. So Elsewhere on the inflation front, we got import price data now down year over year. Uh, so again, this spiked higher, was leading overall inflation rates, and now coming down at negative on a year over year basis. So that should start to filter into the prices of goods, obviously, uh, and be helpful in terms of inflation there. And lastly, looking at producer prices continue to trend lower, similar CPI, but has been a little bit faster, let's say, on the way up and now faster on the way down. So perhaps, again, similar to import prices, that's a leader, leading indi indicator for CPI and saying this time that we're going to see lower rates of CPI in the months to come. It's the lowest since March 2021 for this producer price index. So all of these data points, good for the Fed to say we can pause, suspect that when we get to that May meeting, you'll have additional evidence here, both CPI and PPI should be even lower at that point if you're looking at the data points between now and that next meeting and that should give the fed uh, enough comfort if they want to pause but 
let's talk about what the Fed's done so far in terms of, of this Fed put. So what is the Fed put? The Fed put is this idea that when market prices fall pretty rapidly uh, and too fast uh, for the Fed's comfort, they step in to do something to try to change the psychology and to try to prop up asset prices and build back confidence uh, in markets. And in terms of prices falling very quickly, it wasn't the overall market this time around. It was really limited to the regional banking sector. But what we saw there is just one of the most rapid declines that we've seen in history. So if we look at the two week declines in this regional bank ETF, 28% decline that trailed only March 2020 in terms of ranking the worst two week declines in history. Uh, and if we look at all of these other data points on here in terms of large declines in the in the banking ETF, uh, what was the Fed doing during these times? They were easing monetary policy. So to say that the Fed isn't looking at this today and they're not likely to do something, I think uh, would be ignoring the history behind it. And indeed, the Fed is already doing uh, quite a lot behind the scenes. So while they still did hike interest rates, uh, what they did so far is provide a massive amount of liquidity uh, to these banks in the system. And if we look at the discount window, so this is like the Fed's, the lender of last resort, banks go to the discount window, borrow. We saw a over $150 billion uh, spike in discount window lending in just one week. And that surpassed the record that was set in 2008 of I think around 112 billion. So pretty wide margin, we surpassed that. So the Fed is increasing their loans to banks, doing it in a number of different ways that you know, the mechanics don't really matter all too much. Uh, but the result of this is now the Fed's balance sheet is moving upward again. So we had, if you remember, that quantitative tightening where the Fed was letting those uh, securities that it held on its balance sheet that it had purchased in 2020, 2021, massive amounts of quantitative easing, buying treasury bonds and mortgage, mortgage bonds. So they were letting those roll off month after month. Uh, and we had a pretty sizable rate of decline here, 626 billion from the peak in the Fed's balance sheet in April, 2022 to the low in March 2023 before Silicon Valley Bank failed. But with the bank failures, all of that changed. Fed is now lending directly to these banks, increasing the size of its balance sheet. In fact, the $392 billion increase in its balance sheet over the last two weeks is the biggest two-week increase since March and April of 2020. So very quickly, Fed's reversing 60% of this decline. So very... Uh, kind of methodical decline here in terms of, of letting these securities roll off. And then we have this potential crisis and this Fed put is, is there. It's just providing liquidity. Now, some would argue this isn't the same. It's not quantitative easing because the Fed isn't buying bonds just yet. They're not buying mortgage bonds and treasury bonds. But the end result is the same. Fed is stepping in, providing a massive amount of li liquidity trying to change the psychology of market participants. Uh, and we'll see if that's enough. Now, what is the market saying in terms of, is this going to be enough? Market saying, no, not gonna be enough. The Fed's gonna need to not only increase its balance sheet via loans and swaps and other things, but the Fed is also at some point, pretty soon gonna have to start cutting rates. Now, this might be the wrong expectation, but as of now, market's saying Fed is gonna start cutting rates some point this summer, and they're going to continue to cut rates down to around 3% by the end of 2024. So market's saying the cycle has turned. The Fed is not going to just sit by and watch the banking crisis go on without trying to do something more uh, than they've done so far. And so the market's expectation is they're going to come in and try to save the day again through interest rate cuts. And so the question will be, of course, is the market going to be right here or are we going to have uh, markets rebound? Let's say regional banks start to rebound, confidence comes back in, and then these expectations change to the point where the Fed is 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 not cutting rates. They're going to leave rates higher for longer. I think that's going to be a back and forth. But at the very least, this argues for a potential pause at that May meeting. And then if you look at the last reason for that pause, 
I think we have to look at the yield curve and the action there. And this is really a function of what market participants are expecting in terms of those future rate cuts. Uh, we saw the quickest uh, steepening of the yield curve. So we had the spread between the 10 year and two year treasury yield spike 65 basis points over a seven day period. We haven't seen a move that big in a seven day period since uh, the 2001 recession. And so how did that happen? It was really just a collapse in that two year treasury yield. So you have two year treasury yield really collapsing on the expectation the Fed's going to start cutting interest rates. So two, year, two years from now, that Fed funds rate is going to be lower. And you saw that two year go from 505, which was its highest level uh, since 2007, and then very quickly decline 124 basis points which was actually the largest seven day decline since October, 1987. So during the uh, stock market crash back in 1987, you had saw yields going up pretty rapidly before the crash. And then the crash hits, the Fed cuts interest rates and you start to see yields come down rapidly. So um, the market is saying that the Fed is going to do something similar, at least for now. Again, if the, if the data improves, if confidence comes back, regional bank stocks stabilized, deposit outflows are really stemmed, then that could change. But as of now, this is the current expectation. So if we look at that yield curve, what is that signal from steepening? So you've heard me talk about that inverted yield curve and how that's preceded uh, the last uh, six recessions in the US. Well, if we look at these recessions here in 1980, uh, and uh, the double dip in, in the early 1980s in the 1990-91 recession, 2001 recession, 2008-2009 recession, and the 2020 recession. What you see here is an inversion uh, in advance of each of these recessions. But then as you start to get in or closer to that start of the recession, what you see is a steepening of the yield curve. So the question is, is, is what we saw in the last few weeks the start of that, the start of that steepening process. And how does that steepening process usually come about? Well, it's usually from the Fed or the expectation that the Fed will start cutting interest rates and you see those that two year drop down uh, pretty dramatically. So will this continue? I don't know if it does. Is it signaling something? Well, it seems based on history here that it likely is. Uh, and it's kind of circular in a way, because if the Fed is seeing recessionary data coming, obviously, they're more likely to cut interest rates. And if they cut interest rates, the yield curve is going to steepen if they cut interest rates rapidly. Uh, and so we'll see how it plays out. But certainly uh, yet another example of a signal kind of pointing to economic weakness here. So if we look at that leading economic indicators, we look at this every month, we look at the year over year rate of change continues to get more negative. And just the last few times that we've seen it this negative, the economy was in or close to being in a recession. So uh, this is not just the yield curve. They have other data points, obviously, in there as well. Uh, housing is, is a component in there. We'll talk about that. But uh, it's a number of indicators pointing to uh, future economic weakness. Uh, the one I like to look at because it's such a big part of the U.S. economy is consumer data and looking at retail sales. And importantly, again, you can't look at this retail sales number on a nominal basis. So you can't look at it without including inflation because inflation is still obviously pretty high, even at 6%, well above the averages from the last 20 years. And if we adjust for inflation now, we have six consecutive months where that year over year uh, rate of change of retail sales is negative. So you take out uh, inflation, you adjust for inflation, uh, and you have consumers spending less than they did a year ago. So uh, to me, that's uh, if that persists, obviously, that's kind of often what happens during recessions. You have negative retail, real retail sales for some period of time during a recession. Depending on how long and how deep the recession is, this could get worse or it could, it, it could improve. But this is something you tend to see, you typically see during a recession. We talked about a number of reasons why the U.S. consumer might be starting to pull back just from the fact that their savings rates had gone down so much. And at a certain point, they might start 
to worry about the future and not spend as much today. And also credit had been uh, increasing at a pretty rapid pace. So they might at some point, given high interest rates on credit card debt and other loans, they might start to think twice or not have as much access to credit there. Those are two reasons why consumer spending uh, might come down. And we don't yet have that other main reason, which is unemployment. We don't have that factor there just yet, but that's kind of behind the scenes. If that were to happen, obviously, then you have a full-fledged recession on your hands. And lastly, in terms of economic indicators, this is one that's not going away. It's going to be here for many months just be, until that affordability equation changes. Uh, housing activity just is unlikely to see a sharp rebound because the demand is simply not there. And if we look at existing home prices now, we're now negative on a year over year basis, not a huge decline, but negative, a change nonetheless. We haven't seen that in over a decade. And so uh, prices slowly coming down, uh, uh, affordability still remains the major issue. And without mortgage rates really moving back down quickly, uh, you need prices to come down to spur demand because People just can't get a mortgage uh, given that high price of the home based on their current income. So you still have home prices up significantly, even though they've gone down in recent months, still up significantly from where they were before the pandemic and people's income simply are not up anywhere near that much. So let's talk about uh, blood on the streets. There's a famous saying that you want to buy when there's blood on the streets. And what that basically means is that you want to buy when there's fear and there's panic and there's pain uh, in the markets. And uh, we haven't seen too much of that in the past decade. Uh, if we're looking at bank failures and the total assets of bank failures, the combined assets of the bank failures from 2010 through 2021 uh, were way less than just the two bank failures that we saw uh, just recently. So we finally have some distress in the markets, uh, but it's really concentrated so far in just a few institutions. Uh, but that created opportunity for others to come in and step in and buy some of those assets at a discounted price. Uh, and thus far, the market's saying that that price is going to be favorable to these uh, companies that bought them. So New York Community Bank comes in and buys uh, a, a bunch of signature banks, assets. First Citizens Bank uh, comes in and buys Silicon Valley, some of their assets. Uh, and they're buying these assets, presumably at a discount to their market value. And so you're seeing their share prices jump here. And this is the overall regional bank ETF for comparison, hasn't moved much at all. So you're seeing still pressure in that regional bank banking sector, still people saying, what's really going to be the next shoe to drop. Uh, but you're seeing opportunity for some of the banks that are in a stronger position to take advantage of this dislocation. And then, of course, we had that big one here, which is kind of like a fire sale where UBS was uh, persuaded, uh, presumably by the Swiss government and the authorities there to buy Credit Suisse. Uh, and so they purchased it in a stock deal for around $3 billion U.S., uh, and we saw an initial jump of UBS stock, but it came in a little, but nevertheless, you didn't see a decline. So presumably market participants, at least saying, uh, this purchase of credit Swiss and the details were pretty favorable. It seems to UBS, they didn't take on a lot of the excess baggage. They don't have to assume uh, a lot of the risk that was within credit Swiss. So, uh, assuming that they can maintain the businesses and customers, uh, behind credit Swiss, there's going to be some value there, just a stunning collapse. Uh, this didn't happen overnight. Credit Suisse lost uh, over 7 billion Swiss francs last year. So uh, this wasn't a surprise. I know a lot of people were talking about and, and the Swiss authorities saying, and even within Credit Suisse blaming this on the US bank failures, but this had been going on for uh, quite a while. It was really one executive a high level mistake after another at Credit, Credit Suisse and they're bleeding money and they're bleeding confidence and bleeding customers and deposits and a uh, crisis of confidence has been building over the years. So UBS steps in, you know, massive uh, backstop by the Swiss Na National Bank to help facilitate that. Uh, so uh, all evidence 
seems to suggest that the too big to fail concept is not just a US thing, global thing. Uh, Credit Swiss assets just enormous, and they're saying it's too big of an institution. We have to find a solution. We're going to try uh, uh, to uh, do whatever we can uh, to kind of save the system. And so uh, the, the question I think for the future will be, uh, what's the what's the rationale to let these uh, let these banks and businesses get so big that you become so dependent on them? Uh, that they will need a bailout in the future. So there has to be, I think, some foresight uh, in terms of these get, businesses get so big and so complicated. Uh, and at that point, uh, the management can't oversee everything effectively. Uh, and so they're not only too big to fail, they too, become too big to succeed. So not sure what the solution for that is, but to wait till it gets to a crisis uh, level uh, doesn't seem to be a prudent thing. But uh, really fascinating that back in 2007, Credit Suisse was a $90 billion company. I put out a tweet that it was actually at the time a larger company than Apple, if you could believe that. Apple, of course, now biggest company uh, in the U.S., over $2 trillion, $2.5 trillion market cap. Uh, Credit Suisse was actually higher than it in 2007. This was a, a month before uh, the first iPhone was released. So a lot can change. Uh, in, uh, in, in this period of time since 2007, 2022. But in terms of, of what people are thinking the next shoe to drop is, I think it, within the banking sex, sector, the one company uh, people are most focused on seems to be First Republic, just given the size of the company, pretty substantial, uh, and how quickly the stock has deteriorated and really not recovered as much as the other regional banks. So a number of things were done. Uh, JP Morgan and the Fed extended uh, liquidity, a huge amount, tens of billions uh, to First Republic. And then you had this uh, uh, this uh, 11 bank uh, deposit of 30 billion. So you have all of these diff different banks, uh, major U.S. banks, the biggest banks in the U.S., saying we're going to try to instill confidence in the system uh, by depositing our uh, our assets, a portion of our assets, into First Republic, thirty billion total. Uh, the bigger banks deposited more; the smaller banks a little bit less. I did a table here showing you the percentage of each of these companies' assets uh, and deposits and cash that they put in to First Republic. So uh, we'll see if, if this works. So far, it really hasn't. I think the stock is lower uh, than when they did this. Uh, so uh, thus far, it ha I don't think it's had the in intended result. Maybe it, people viewed it as not being big enough or maybe this scared people even more. Not sure. Uh, but if we look at the stock of First Republic Bank, uh, just a stunning turn of events very quickly here. Uh, you go back to its IPO, December 2010, 2550 a share, and then just a tremendous run-up similar to Silicon Valley Bank uh, was one of the leading uh, stocks in that uh, regional banking sector over, the, over this last decade. Just huge, huge uh, increase in its, its share value uh, and uh, peaks in November 2021, similar kind of the uh, growth and tech peak. Uh, and since then, down 95% and uh, hitting still you know, near its all-time low. So while you've seen you know, somewhat of a stabilization uh, in a number of these regional banks, I think there's still that fear that First Republic uh, is the next shoe to drop. And no one really knows what the deposit situation is there and, and when it will hit uh, a point where really they can't. Um, they can't do anything but let it fail and have a bigger bank or someone else take over. So uh, we'll see what happens there. I think until there's an explicit guarantee in the short run, you're still going to have the situation where if a bank has a high percentage of its assets in non uh, FDIC insured uh, deposits, uh, then those people are still going to say, as they should have been doing before, well, maybe uh, there's a risk here of me losing it. Uh, and maybe I won't get bailed out like uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were, and maybe I should move first uh, and then ask questions later. So it's really hard to stem that psychology in the short run without explicit guarantee or without just complete transparency that this bank is going to be fine uh, regardless of withdrawal. So it's hard to say that because you get a huge rush of withdrawals and very quickly 
a bank cannot be fined. Uh, they, you know, they may have uh, some liquidity there, but they don't have the ability to obviously lose, you know, twenty percent, let's say, of their deposits in a single day. Right? They probably can't, uh, won't be able to meet that for very long. And even if they are able to meet that, well, then the question becomes. Well, what is the bank's business going forward if they're losing this massive amount of deposits? Are they going to come back in the future? Uh, and a bank is worth what its ability to make uh, money in the future is. So if they're making money off those deposits, those loans, those customers, and they're losing these customers, obviously the bank is going to be worth uh, much less. So no predictions for me here. Other than that, it's unlikely, it seems, that there won't be some other bank that has a problem at some point here uh, stemming from this, just because we don't know, we don't see that daily flows of deposits uh, and uh, no one suspected, uh, you know, a few weeks before Silicon Valley or Signature, no one suspected that they were about to go under. And uh, uh, people are talking about First Republic, but there's probably banks out there that no one's talking about that are at risk as well. So. Let's talk about uh, deflation, and you probably haven't heard the word deflation very much. Obviously, it's all about inflation uh, in terms of what the Fed's worried about and the average American's worried about. But if we look at household net worth, what we've seen actually is a deflation in net worth in 2022, the second biggest increase on record uh, after 2008. So what we saw in 2019, 2020, 2021, record increases in net worth and why are these going up so much well simply stock market housing going up uh, significant amounts during that period of time housing being the number one asset for most americans most households uh, and so that driving a major portion of this and then in 2022 you have stocks obviously going down home prices uh, not up very much uh, down actually on a real basis but nominal still higher uh, so giving back some of these gains and, and really, if you look at it in perspective, a pretty small portion of those increases given back. So this is over 45 billion, uh, or over 45 trillion in combined increases from 2019 through 2021 and just a 4 trillion so far decrease in 2022. So question is, it's similar thinking in terms of wealth effect, people feel wealthier, they spend more money. That was the Fed's policy for a long time to try to, try to drive up asset prices saying it was justified because it's going to help the economy. People are going to spend more money if they think they have uh, more money. If their house has gone up, the value of their stock portfolio is going, going up, uh, they're going to spend more money. Well, now we might see the opposite effect of this with, I think, housing being the most important component. People, obviously, a direct consequence. If your house is lower in value, you're less likely to take out, let's say, a home equity line of credit or you have less credit uh, available to you. You might put, put less in, in terms of renovation or upgrade uh, in terms of, of your house, so less spending there. Uh, but just psychologically, it's something that that is there behind the scenes where if people feel like their net worth is going down, they're likely to spend a little bit less. So that's a deflationary force, of course. So let's talk about paper hands. And this was a, this is kind of a crazy idea that uh, came about during the 2021 mania and meme stocks that there's these uh, so-called diamond hands that were these traders and meme stocks. And they were saying they're never going to sell these stocks ever. So GameStop, uh, AMC, uh, and Bed Bath & Beyond came one of the leading uh, meme stocks. Why it did, I, I'm not really sure, but it did. And they were saying, we're never going to sell these. Doesn't matter. We're going to hold on to these forever. Of course, that notion is absurd. You don't have a record of anyone's buys and sells and they could sell that very next day. You would never know it. These are just people on a message board saying that they're never going to sell. And if we look at Bed Bath and & Beyond uh, and, we, and we talk about this diamond hand concept, I think it's pretty obvious that people did sell. And so uh, this was the mean stock mania over here. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond obviously had been uh, going down for quite some time before that point in time, been losing money. Uh, for a number of years here. But then the crazy thing was, is that all of that was ignored during the meme stock mania. 
and now it's back to reality. So here we are, Bed Bath Beyond today below its IPO price. So it IPOs in June 1992. Its market cap is around 288 million, and then it goes all the way up 20 years later to a market cap of 17 billion. Uh, pretty incredible got that it got that high. I was surprised to see that. Uh, and then fast forward to today, uh, we're now down under a hundred million, 99 and a half percent so far. So seems like it's headed towards uh, bankruptcy. We'll see uh, what happens in the next couple of weeks. But uh, this is just another kind of healing in my view of the market in terms of that meme stock mania day by day is 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 really wearing off you're getting back to the reality of of people valuing companies based on their net income based on their cash flows so that ultimately is a good thing but never fall for that trap of of diamond hands and i'm not sure we'll see that again maybe we will but uh that i think that that mania is probably done for a while uh the odds are not in your favor so you want to you want to as an investor look for places where the long-term odds are in your favor. Uh, and if we talk about uh, active mutual funds and, and trying to pick the uh, best active fund out there, uh, it's a thing that a lot of people try to do, they want to do. In theory, uh, there are obviously active companies, uh, active mutual fund companies that do well, uh, and certainly in short periods of time, any given year, you're going to find a number of funds that outperform their benchmark. But as time goes on and you go to three years and five years and 10 years, uh, and you look at the funds and you include the funds that have gone away, gone out of business, shut down because of poor performance, what you find is that very few uh, mutual funds over a 20 year period beat their benchmarks. So the vast majority over, over 90% in most categories are underperforming the benchmark. And there was this old saying by, uh, Jack, Jack Bogle, the, uh, founder of Vanguard. Uh, he said, don't buy, don't look for the needle in the haystack, just buy the haystack. Essentially he's saying, trying to pick that fund that's going to outperform is, is trying to like trying to find a needle in the haystack, very hard to do. So just buy the whole haystack and you'll benefit uh, from that growth. So if you buy that entire index and try, instead of trying to pick that winner, uh, you're going to benefit in the long run by obviously saving on fees, but also not then picking a fund, obviously that's substantially un underperformed. So not only are you risking, um, underperformance, you could be risking, uh, large underperformance and this chart doesn't really show that. And so, um, the odds just aren't in your favorite favor. Can you do it? Of course, uh, it's possible you could get lucky and, and, but how, how can you tell in advance 20 years, uh, before that that fund is going to be one of the winner, winners, very hard to do. And this, I think is an important le lesson on diversification. Uh, that we got from the Silicon Valley Bank thing. I don't think anyone's really talked about it so far, so I wanted to touch on this. There's just a lot of stock-based compensation in Silicon Valley Bank Financial. So if you worked at Silicon Valley Bank as part of your compensation, you'd be receiving this annual award in stock. Uh, depending on your position, you may have gotten... Uh, X percent uh, and maybe more of the higher level management certainly would get uh, more in stock. But I think the lesson here for investors is if you work at a company uh, and you get this stock based award, often the question is, well, I uh, should, what should I do with it? Should I keep it all in there? I'd like the company, I, the company's doing well. Uh, and I don't see any reason to sell it. Uh, I, and some people say, I don't want to pay the tax on that. Uh, so there's a million reasons you'd say to to keep that and really the only reason to sell it is the risk that that company is going to underperform uh, let's say a broad market index or worse the risk that that company goes bankrupt so you're adding additional risk in that you a already work for this company so you have exposure to that area now you're doubling down on that by having your savings or your retirement tied to that as well if you have a significant portion in stock. So for a long time for 
uh, people that worked at, at Silicon Valley Bank, they probably viewed this as a good thing, this concentration risk. If they had this stock, it was appreciating, especially during the mania in 2020, 2021, way above what the S&P 500 was doing. So it was probably uh, you know, the equivalent of winning you know, the lottery in terms of you're working at this company, company's doing extremely well, and I'm getting this paid in stock, and that's doing really well. Uh, and at the end of 2021, you're probably feeling really good about that and saying there's really no reason for me to sell it. Uh, things are looking great. It's been it's a good thing that I didn't sell it and diversify all of these years. Uh, but very quickly, obviously, things change. Uh, and here we are today. This is showing you as of the uh, close of the last day of trading for SVB. But this really has gone down to zero. So. Uh, you know, it's 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 a, an extreme example, but I think an important example. It's not to say that if you have stock that you need to sell everything. Everyone's situation is different, so they have to evaluate what percentage of their savings assets are tied to this. But the lesson is, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You probably want to diversify. Uh, it's probably the odds of you being at a company that for a long period of time outperforms an index is, is just very low. Similar to the odds of you picking any given stock in an outperforming index, very low. It's not impossible. Of course, there's plenty of people that have worked at Apple and Google and Amazon over the last decade and done extremely well by holding the stock. Uh, but the vast majority of people who do that are not going to have that similar outcome. So it makes sense to at least pursue some diversification strategy just in case, because by the time this type of risk prevents presents itself, and it doesn't have to be this extreme, of course, it doesn't have to be a bankruptcy, a total collapse. But by the time you get to that point, well, then it's too late to really do something about it. Then anyone who's had shares in Silicon Valley financial and all of a sudden very quickly uh, it stops trading. Well, now you can't do anything about it. So the time to think about diversification, the best time is when you don't need to be thinking about it when that asset class or security is doing extremely well. And so this is a lesson we learn all the time uh, with, uh, with uh, concentrated positions. They can be extremely beneficial on the way up, uh, but it's only uh, when risk presents itself that you see uh, the problems with concentration. So I want to end with something positive like we often do. This is really helpful uh, in terms of the inflation data that we're getting from the commodities market. And if we look at commodities, what a scare that we had last year in, in March. It really looked like we were just going to see commodities continue to push higher. All major commodities were hitting the highest levels in a long time. And you had a number of factors pushing prices higher. And now we're just seeing the opposite situation. Commodity index recently now down 37% from that peak uh, last March. And the biggest year of year declines we're seeing since May 2020. And so if we look at uh, these commodities, these are all the major commodities. And we look at where we are today versus a year ago. What a difference here. So a year ago, almost every single commodity is up and up big. Uh, and higher than the rate of inflation at the time, which was 7.9%. And now nearly everything down on a year over year basis and below that rate of CPI, which is 6%. So this is probably the main reason why I think the next few inflation prints are going to be uh, pretty good ones because you're going to see these comparisons, especially in terms of, of heating oil and uh, natural gas filtering in and obviously gas prices, uh, all of these components are going to be pushing that inflation rate lower, whereas a year ago, they were helping to push it higher. So very good thing to see uh, for everyone. We need some inflation relief. Uh, we can talk about you know, why this is happening. And part, part of it, of course, is that the economy is slowing, not just the US economy, but global economy. But this is a necessary thing uh, that we needed to occur to start to get inflation in check. So a good thing to see and hopefully it continues. So I want to end it right there. Have a great week, everyone. If you like the content, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time. Thanks.